Hi there and welcome. Today we're taking a look at the ICL MPS 3000 Comet microcomputer. And uh, this is a machine that was made in Denmark for the British company ICL. Uh, this machine is a CPM machine and I expect there to be uh, the basic CPM components inside like a Z80 CPU, 64K of RAM, uh, some address decoders, a floppy drive controller and uh, a display output and uh, that's basically it for these kind of machines. All the CPM machines were practically identical internally and uh, if you look at this machine and you look at something like the Amstrad CPC the internal structure is more or less identical because otherwise they couldn't uh, run the CPM uh, programs. So anyway this is a very early model I think it's from about 1980-1981 uh, and um, I think most of it would be discrete components, 7.4 LS series kind of stuff. And that is basically where the difference is between this machine and uh, the Amstrad CPC series. And of course the original CPM machines were all black and white. As far as I know the Amstrad CPC machines are using a kind of different uh, screen architecture to the original um, CPM machine. But uh, otherwise um, they are very very similar. So yeah, uh, let's open it up and have a look inside. You can see on the front here there's a power switch. Uh, looks like those on the coffee machine, coffee maker. Uh, the reset switch is very similar and uh, there are two um, 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives. And uh, the keyboard is uh, sheet metal, it's very heavy. So if we just flip it around we can see two I.O. sockets, uh, a keyboard connector, a parallel port connector which is uh, basically a printer connector, serial port connector, an expansion slot that is not populated, a video out and a power in and a fuse. Uh, and that's basically uh, the standard kind of stuff for a CPM machine. So uh, this machine is, uh, as you can see, made in Denmark and I expect the quality to be really really good despite of it having uh, been sitting in a, in a garage for many many years. Uh, Danish electronics companies are famous for very high quality but also expensive and uh, I think that is why this company didn't last, because their product was just too expensive. But uh, anyway, let's take a look inside and uh, see you oh, very nice. So yeah, uh, basically what we have inside is a 19 inch rack case with Euro cards and uh, with some cables to the different connectors. And at the back we have two floppy drives and a toroid transformer and a power supply at the back here. So. Uh, it's a very nice design as I, as I suspected. The power supply, uh, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but it's basically a standard uh, linear supply. There's a torrent transformer, some uh, diodes and some power transistors and uh, some large capacitors of course. But um, what is quite interesting here are the plug-in cards. It's not one big PCB for everything, but uh, individual boards and uh, I really like it. Uh, and also if you can get it out, you can see that these are two layer boards on Euro cards. So uh, I think I will try and reverse engineer this machine and get the schematic out. Um, because uh, this is the first ICL CPM machine and uh, basically the rest of them must be very very similar. Um, this board here is the CPU board and uh, that's the main CPU here. There's a little clock oscillator which is uh, how many megahertz. Uh, it says 0, 0.000, so we don't know exactly. Uh, then there's a boot ROM here, it's called HHROM and it's from June 1981. Uh, and the chips are from uh, the early weeks, week 2 of 1981, something like that. So this machine must be from, uh, from June 1981. Apart from that we have some drivers here, because uh, the CPU board of course has to drive all the other boards. It goes to a backplane down here and uh, all the other boards plug into there. So we have some uh, 
244 2 by 5 line drivers. Then we have a little bit of a glue logic. We have the clock oscillator and uh, I guess some address decoders for this uh, ROM here. Um, CPM is a little bit special in that uh, they try to preserve memory. It has a maximum of 64K and uh, this boot ROM is only uh, available during booting. Once the operating system has booted, this ROM will be uh, removed from the memory map and then we have additional RAM available where this ROM used to be. So uh, yeah, very very basic design, two layer board. And uh, you can see on the back here that the, the layout has been done with, uh, with tape. It's not used to computer aided design, there's no computer design here. All the wires are done via tape. And that's why they have this uh, curved uh, layout. But it uh, looks very nice, I, I should say, very good quality. And uh, there's no corrosion basically. Uh, it looks very, very good. So uh, I hope we can get this one powered up and uh, get it working. Okay, so that was the CPU board. Uh, I better plug it in again. Uh, I'm not sure the. I don't think the location of these cards in the rack here is uh, important. But you never know, so I better plug it in. So that was the CPU board. And the next board is... Oh, the next board is a RAM board. These chips are 2K uh, each. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. There are um, 32K of RAM on this board. and. Uh, yeah, nothing much to say here. We again have the, uh, the interface logic to the bus and uh, of course somewhere on this board we must have an address decoder. And uh, that's it really. It's a little bit of funny stuff going on here. This is a, a CMOS device 4069 and some, uh, some resistors and capacitors. Uh, I think this is generating minus 5 volts for the RAM chips uh, locally on this board. It looks like uh, some kind of uh, oscillator or something like that and a couple of diodes or voltage doubler. So uh, yeah, I think uh, that's what's happening here. These chips would require negative voltage. And uh, that was the memory board. And there's a memory board, me uh, there's a one more memory board next to it which is identical. Uh, I'm not going to take that out. Uh, the next board then is a board for... Yeah, there's a couple of cables going to the back of the box. And uh, the top one, the big one, is for the keyboard and uh, the video. So basically what we have here is a typical CPM uh, architecture. We have the main computer, then we have a board here, which is basically a VT100 terminal. Uh, it takes serial in. And to the CPU it basically just looks like a COM port and you will send commands to this board uh, like a move cursor up, move cursor down, put an A here. Uh, so it's not memory mapped, it's mapped through a COM port. And uh, that was important as well. Um, you couldn't play games of course because everything had to go through this COM port to be displayed on screen. But, uh, but still it was important because then your, your, your screen memory would take up just one serial port. So maybe two or four bytes or something for your entire screen. Uh, so there's a clever, clever design, but uh, uh, later on when the PCs had more memory, of course, uh, of course the, the the graphics would be mapped into the CPU's memory space. Uh, but I mean, this is typical for the early, early, early 80s, very late 70s. Um, this kind of architecture. And uh, what have we got here? We have a video and keyboard board uh, logic gates here for the memory, uh, sorry for the CPU bus. Um, some address decoding taking place here. We have some screen memory. There's a 246. There's 8 kilobytes of screen memory and um, that is a static RAM I think. Uh, 2114 I think that's a static RAM. Uh, then we have the, uh, the video chip itself, it's a 6845 and uh, basically everything is in there uh, to do the screen memory. Then there is an EEPROM here and uh, that must be the character, the character set for the video, like the letters, the bitmaps for each letter, A, B, C and so forth. 
And uh, then there's a little bit of a squeeze here. I think they didn't uh, have enough PCB space. But uh, there's a clock oscillator and uh, some I.O. for the keyboard here. And uh, that's it. A very nice little design. I'm definitely going to uh, reverse engineer this machine. I really love it and I, I would like to build one uh, to play around with. Very straightforward uh, CPM design. Textbook, really. Okay, the next board here is for serial and parallel. And of course this one is parallel, the printer port, and the little one down here is for the serial port. And uh, let's take that one out. Ah, there we go. And uh, yeah, there's not much to see here. There's a Zilog uh, Z80 PIO uh, chip, which is a parallel port chip. And it goes through some buffers for the printer port. And the serial board, serial bus. Serial bus. Uh, there's no serial board controller, so that must go through the PIO as well. So the serial to parallel conversion must be done in software somewhere. And uh, that is quite unusual. Of course it saves some cost on the, on the ICs. But yeah, very interesting. And the last board, if uh, I can get this one back in, the last board is the floppy disk controller. And uh, I can already here see a big chip. And uh, there we got it. Um, this is the very standard NEC, the D675 floppy disk controller. And, um, and that's it really, the floppy disk controller here. Uh, interface to the CPU and the uh, some drive line drivers and stuff here for the for the floppy disk controller connector uh, down down here. So uh, yeah, very very straightforward little machine, and I'm definitely gonna reverse engineer it. I, I really like it. It's it's brilliant. Another thing is that I can probably get the floppy disks, uh, the operating system, from the Danish Data Museum. So uh, that's really brilliant. I've been looking at this uh, machine. Uh, just quickly when I took it apart here and uh, there are two fuses in the power supply and they're both blown so uh, I cannot plug it in but uh, I think we will do a, we will do a repair video um, coming up shortly uh, I'm very keen on this machine really okay and uh, I just flipped it around so you can see the power supply and uh, the floppy drives the, ply, the power supply is using a toroid transformer and uh, some uh, linear regulators up here. And uh, the board is all made from uh, op, op amps and, uh, and power transistors. There are no voltage regulator ICs in this board here. The floppy drives are interesting in that um, it's still working, the tape is still good. But also the optical encoder here is very very interesting. This sticker here, that is used by the serviceman to adjust the number of uh, revolutions per minute and uh, basically you can see it says 50 on the inside circle and 60 on the outside circle and uh, if you have 50 hertz from your light bulbs in your room uh, they'll be flickering at 50 hertz and uh, if the speed of this one is correct it will look like these uh, lines are standing still and uh, the same for 60 hertz if you're in the US or Japan you will see the outer line uh, as standing still uh, when it's rotating at the correct speed. So yeah, a very easy way to calibrate your um, your motor speed. Otherwise they are a slightly different version than the ones in the original IBM. Uh, they're still using a flat cable as we saw just now. Um, but I still think these are serial, these are serial data coming in here. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, see you again soon.